Welcome to worship at Baptist Church of the Covenant. We are so glad that you are with us this morning. If you're a guest or friend or family, welcome. Thank you for joining us. At the start of this Lenten journey, we are looking for trust. It is essential to believing that we will have all we need to finish what we are starting together. Trust is not found in a verse of scripture and it is not prayed for once and revealed. Have you noticed when people talk about trust, they use words like cultivate or earn. They contrast it with faith and compare it to belief. When did you last exercise your trust muscles and what happened? Let's explore that question together today. May God speak to you, dear friend, in this hour and to this collective body of trusters as we make this journey together.
darkness give way to light and winter sleep to fresh beginnings, we come today to be reminded of God's love for us. Like the green shoots of renewed life stirring beneath the soil, we welcome an awakening of God's word in our lives in this time of reflection and repentance. We affirm our identity, we claim our security as children of God. together now because we seek you. We are separated, but we are together in spirit. We are wondering and wandering, and you are the way maker. You are the creator of the universe and all that is within it, and you know our names. You are a God of peace, and you are a God who is mighty. You are a God who is in heaven, and you are a God who is here with us. We are on a journey. We are moving from darkness to light, from despair to hope, from aloneness to community, from death to resurrection. And you have prepared a path for us today and through this season. We, O oh God, prepare our hearts and our lives for your guidance and your companionship. 
be with us today as we worship you. Amen. Please join me in reading the prayer of confession. God, our Redeemer, you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You accompany us in moments of blessedness and in periods of brokenness. Yet we ignore your presence and choose instead to live in self-centered reliance. You remain faithful in your covenant, yet we fail to trust in your provision and love. You show us the ways of justice and righteousness, yet we follow the paths of selfishness and pride. Forgive us, Lord, and accept now the silent confession of our hearts. Have mercy on us, O God. Amen. God frees us from our suffocating isolation so we may breathe anew God's liberating spirit. Trust in God's mercy and steadfast love. We are forgiven. on the steps. My name is Kelly. Hi. This is Avery and Camille. Hello. Hello. The girls and I are doing a little rainbow science experiment today with some Skittles. What are we doing? I'm going to pour this hot water into a plate and Skittles are surrounding the plate and this is warm water. So I'm going to pour it until I'm going to pour it in the until middle. It reaches the Skittles. Until it reaches past the Skittles. That's probably good. I wonder what it's going to make. Mm -hmm. But now hmm. Skittles, you should wait and let and see what the Skittles do. Look, it's well, already you know, forming a rainbow. While we're waiting, you know, this reminds me of a story. What story? Okay. Our Old Testament Bible lesson today is about a promise God made to a man named Noah. Who knows something about Noah? I do. What do you know? He made the ark. Okay. What do you know? Because he put animals. Oh, okay. oh, good. Well, God sent the flood because the people had begun to make lots of bad choices. The flood filled the earth and destroyed everything and everyone except Noah's family and two of every kind of bird and animal. 
You might read this next part of the story later today with your family because this is the reading for this week's Digging into Lent devotion. After the floodwaters went down, God made a promise to Noah. God promised Noah that he would never again destroy the whole earth with the flood. Then God put a rainbow in the sky, rainbow, and said to Noah, I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the promise between me and all life on the earth. God said the rainbow would remind God of the promise that he made. The next time you see a rainbow, remember the promise God made to Noah. And remember that just as God has kept that promise, he keeps all of his promises to you too. Each week of Lent, all of our BCOC children's families are building a resurrection garden. Have we started ours? What does ours look like? Wow. Wow. Mm. We should also take a break to look at all this. The beautiful I think. rainbow. Yes. Yeah. This rainbow. actually reminds me a lot of a donut. A donut. A, a, donut. Donut. a rainbow donut. Okay. Rainbow well, donut. later today, we'll find the Lent number one bag in our kit and add something to this garden, okay? okay. Let us pray. Dear God, Dear God, we are thankful, we are thankful that you keep your promises. That you keep your promises. Help us to keep our promises too. Help us to keep our promises too. Amen. Amen.
Genesis 9, 8 through 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on earth. God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. A reading from Mark 1, 9 through 15. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts and the angels waited on him. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. The word of God in scripture, the word of God among us, the word of God within us, Thanks be to God.
Let us pray together. Almighty, wonderful God, we come before you in prayer to offer you our praise, our thanksgiving, and the concerns of our hearts. You are ever faithful in your love and mercy and have held true to your covenant promises. Thank you, God, for holding steady even when we wander away. Thank you for always calling us back into your tender care. Thank you for walking beside us even when we fail to notice. We step out into this Lenten journey with both hope and caution. As we begin to see the glimmers of light in the darkness of the pandemic, we know that there are still miles to tread before we can find a new normal. Help us to remain close to you as we walk through this continued wilderness. Help us to trust in your guidance and walk in the ways of Christ even when it is difficult. We pray for our world, dear Lord. We ask for peace in the countries where there is violence, conflict, and war. In Myanmar, Syria, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel and Palestine, Nigeria, Venezuela, Libya, Yemen, South Sudan, and Somalia. We pray for our friends in Cuba and Uganda and ask for your special provision and blessing for Shalom Baptist Church and Terra Nova Academy. We lift up to you the UK, South Africa, and all other nations most severely affected by the new coronavirus variants. We pray for our country, O God. May you bring justice and peace to the places where bigotry, oppression, and violence prevail. We pray for Texans and all others who are impacted by the winter storms. We pray for our national, state, and local leaders. May they make wise choices for the good of all people. We ask your blessing upon our nation's vaccination efforts. May the communities who need the vaccines the most receive them quickly. We pray for ourselves, loving God. Be with those in our community who are struggling with grief, illness, depression, unemployment, loneliness, lostness, and fear. Fortify our families and strengthen our marriages, partnerships, and friendships. Help us to show your patient, merciful love to those closest to us. Help us to be generous in the midst of poverty. Help us to be prophetic in the midst of injustice. Help us to be merciful in the midst of challenges. Help us to trust in you and in your way in the midst of uncertainty. We pray all of this in the name of Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In January, our oldest son turned 15. A few days later, he received his driving permit from the state of Alabama. Wasn't it just yesterday he was driving a big wheel? Now he has permission from the state law enforcement agency to drive a 3,500 pound vehicle down the road at speeds I don't even want to think about. This is not bowling with bumpers in the gutters anymore. There are no crash pads to keep him in his lane. And there's certainly not anything keeping those other two ton vehicles zipping through traffic and talking on their phones in their lanes either. And my baby wants to drive every chance he gets. The law requires that a teenager with a learner's permit must have a licensed driver over age 21 in the front passenger seat at all times. Having learned from many of you, the examples of parents before me that these young drivers need as much experience as we can give them. And the more experience they have, the better drivers they seem to be. So nearly every time he asks to drive, we swallow hard and say, of course. To his credit, he does very well. He is conscientious. He's cautious, but confident. Nevertheless, I can be a reactionary passenger. <laughs> searching for the brake pedal to rise up out of the passenger floorboard. Occasionally, I vocalize these expressions to which, so far, he calmly replies, I know, Mom. I'm watching them. I see the other car. I know they're stopping. I know where to turn. I am so grateful that there is no dash cam to catch all of my sidecar shenanigans. This exercise in riding alongside a new driver has awakened my inner control freak who, for the most part, I try to keep muted. <laughs> to be in the car with another driver, to yield the driver's seat, to take on a different role with your child and to allow him to be in control of your destination requires trust. It is his to earn, but it is mine to give. Mark's account of Jesus' baptism and movement into the wilderness is where trust in the gospel story begins for these new believers. Let me start with the ending. In verse 15, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. It's after his baptism and after the trials in the wilderness, Jesus calls all hearers to repent and believe. For our purposes today, it was important to me to point out to you the original meanings of these two words, repent, a change of heart for the better. But scholars say for this word, believe, and even better, more appropriate for this moment in the text, the word is trust. Trust in the good news, Jesus says. This good news is what Jesus knows by heart after his baptism and after his time in the desert. Mark's telling of Jesus' wilderness experience is so different from the other gospel writers. His description is stark. It is limited in detail. It is straight to the point. The verbs are sharp. The images are vivid and clean cut. The great preacher Fred Craddock said, it's difficult to listen to a text when there are other texts in the same room talking about the same subject matter, often in ways that are more elaborate, 
more familiar. But Mark is the text before us today. Even while Matthew and Luke and John are also in the room, it's important for us to give Mark this hearing. It is critical not to wonder too long about the details from the other accounts of Jesus' 40-day trial that seem to be left out of Mark's gospel. It's important for us to stay focused on what is here. The baptism of Jesus the temptation of Jesus, and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. At Jesus' baptism, heaven is torn open. Spirit descends upon him, entering, infusing his whole being, and a voice from heaven claims him, This is my Son, my Beloved. These two, God and Jesus, now abide with each other. Whatever happens next, God will be with God's Son. Today, we focus our attention on the temptation of Jesus, the traditional text for the first Sunday of Lent. Sermons preached out of Matthew or Luke, those versions, might spend their time exploring the ways that Jesus is tested. And they might want to know more about this adversary who is doing the testing not Mark. That same spirit who just alighted on Jesus now beats its wings and nips at Jesus' head, driving him into the wilderness. With spirit in the driver's seat, does Jesus feel out of control? She is charting the course and the destination where he will work out his newly confirmed identity. Soon enough, he will know that he is being steered by a trusted friend, and he is not alone. Do not mistake these 40 days for one long therapy session. Do not imagine Jesus on the mountaintop, shining in the light of heaven, conversing with Elijah and Moses. Do not imagine this as a Sabbath of long walks in the desert to clear his mind. What Mark does say so succinctly is that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beast and tended by the angels. Brian Blunt explains the dynamic well in preaching Mark in two voices. Want to know what happens when you get too close to God? When you get touched by the power of the Spirit, there is no lounging, no lingering to enjoy the view. You don't lay down and take a nap. You don't bask in the glory of what just happened to you. You go immediately to wild work. To work for God is to be thrown directly into the path of those who would oppose God. Tempted by Satan, Mark says. Though Mark does not elaborate on the temptation, he constructs the story so the reader will see that Jesus' time in the wilderness is just as defining as his baptism. Spirit drives Jesus into the desert to meet the enemy. Clearly, God is at work here, but so is the adversary. It is a 40-day struggle. It is a furnace for transformation, for refining an identity and a call. In the testing, Jesus is not weakened, but strengthened. If we let the other Gospels in the room speak a minute, we would know from the adversary's suggestions to Jesus that temptation is rarely obvious. We are not tempted to try what we can't do, but what we know we already can do. The tempter often sounds like a friend or relative. And at the heart of the temptation is not an offer to fall, but to rise. 
The tempter in Eden did not ask, do you wish to be as the devil, but do you wish to be as God? Craddock wrote, no self-respecting Satan would approach a person with offers of personal, social, and professional ruin. That's in the small print at the bottom of the temptation. The promise in Mark seems to be that no successful resistance of temptation is possible without the presence of God. Jesus didn't have to prove himself first to earn his baptism. The baptism and the blessing came first. For us, this means God is not waiting for us to fall. God is trusting us to believe the truth about ourselves and to live into that truth. What does it mean that Jesus was with the wild beasts and attended by angels? It sounds a little like our co-workers, our classroom, our youth group. <laughs> when he wasn't sparring with the enemy, Jesus was still on guard against those who could eat him for lunch. There are real bodily dangers in the desert. He is not just engaging in a contest of wills or spiritual prowess. The risks are real. The teeth are sharp. The beasts are there and they are threatening. Perhaps it was their wildness that inspired Jesus to go toe to toe with Satan. Perhaps they seemed tame compared to who Jesus became in the desert. This Son of God confounds our expectations over and over again. In the wilderness, Jesus lies down with the jackals who sleep through the night. Already, Jesus is changing things. His gospel is changing things. Old lines of predator and prey are starting to fall apart. This is good news. Angels minister to Jesus like shepherds tend the flock or the way a parent nurses a sick child. Jesus is kept to fight another day. I wonder if these angels aren't just as fierce as the beasts. When we're in the fight of our lives, we need courage and strength. No harp strumming angels with soft wings will do. We need a sidewinder sent from God on our side. Mark wants his readers to know that when God calls you to the desert, you don't go alone. The risks are real, no doubt but the blessing encircles you on every side as you walk with him. That you can trust. Walking a labyrinth is a spiritual practice. I've journeyed through these circular winding lines looking for no more than peace and quiet. But other times, I've gone in desperate search of relief and real answers, direction. There is one way in and one way out. The way in is a disciplined walk to the center, pacing yourself on the way. On the way in, I am examining what's in my heart. I'm searching the anxiety. I'm naming the distraction that tests me, that tempts me to be less than. When I arrive at the center, I wait until I can honestly say to God, I'm leaving this piece of myself here. My imagination of what happens to my offering my distraction, my pain, my anxiety, my temptation when I let it go is that God lets it become part of the great compost. 
In the furnace of the labyrinth, my feet find the earth step by step and ground me in truth. Who God is. Who I am. What must be yielded to God's hand alone is often revealed in this circular walk. Walking back out from the center is an exercise in trust. When I walk away from this enlightened path, will I know the way forward? Friends, God doesn't sit on a throne at the center of a labyrinth, nor at the top of the mountain, nor the chancel of the sanctuary. If you walked up to the entry point or the mouth of the trail or the door of the church, you can trust that it was spirit who drove you there. You're not getting dropped off. You're being carried. The only way through the wilderness and forward is with God at your side. To preach the temptation of Jesus in Mark is to call attention to our greatest temptation. The temptation to think that God is not present. It's hard for me to talk you down from that point of view after this past year this most difficult, grief-ridden, lonely, unprecedented year. It is tempting to think that God was absent on those darkest days, that God had given up, had withdrawn. I know it's easy to fall back into questioning our worthiness of God's love and presence, and Lent can often perpetuate that thinking. That's why I'm asking you to claim trust this week as an essential of our faith. Because the truth of Mark 1 verses 9 through 15 is that God is without any doubt present with us in all things. My advice let us not make Lent any harder than this life already is this year. If you're making your way in the world day by day, treating others with kindness and yourself with fairness, if you're doing something for the good of someone else once a week, and spending a few minutes with your face turned toward God almost every day? Consider it a win. That great Buddhist teacher, Thich Nhat Han, said, The miracle is not to walk on water, but on the earth. Side by side, my friends, that's how we make this journey. Trusting spirit to drive us with Jesus in the sidecar and a church full of sidewinders who will tend to you with care and fiercely guard you from the wild beasts. That's who we are. You can trust that God did not call you to the desert and leave you to navigate it alone. We're in this together. May it be so, Lord. Amen.
morning, Covenant family. I know that some of you are still in your pajamas, but you look wonderful. And I'm sure looking forward to seeing all of you here in our sanctuary again soon. I'm bringing you announcements on behalf of your deacons. Here's some of the things that are going on that we want to make sure you know about. Registration for Lenten small groups is now underway and there are gonna be several interesting groups. There's gonna be one on do-it-yourself note cards led by Joyce Mitchell, one on watercolor painting led by Marsha Henderson, and a yoga group led by Rachel Butler. And then we're gonna bring in a guest Methodist. My old and dear friend, Charles Alexander, is gonna lead a group on spirituality and aging. And I can tell you, all of these groups are gonna be interesting. You, as usual, it's going to be hard to choose. Each group has its own registration page, so you want to go to bcoc.net slash Lent for the links. It's a new year, and we have our first business meeting coming up on Wednesday, which you can join by Zoom, and we want to have you there. You can find out the information for that in the crossroads. And after the business meeting, our series called Called to Life is going to begin, which will be the focus for Lent on the Christian understanding of vocation. We will take time to reflect on this, and in these sessions we will seek out the deeper meaning of our lives as we explore the questions around vocation in the faith sense and discover our own sense of God's calling in our lives. There's a link to a, a guide for participants at bcoc.net slash Lent, or you can go through the crossroads. I hope you all have a lovely week, and it's good to talk to you. Help us make the hard decisions about what to keep and what to give away. Let us know when enough is enough. When we have all that we can say grace over, and when we have space to care for more, as we pay attention to what is important, guide our practice of serving and giving this Lenten season. Amen.